Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in Tube Lab number 53, we're going to talk a little bit about negative feedback. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Ah, negative feedback. It plays a role in much of the sound we listen to. But what in the heck is it? Well, basically it's the feeding back of an audio signal to a preceding stage. The reason it's negative is we need a signal that's 180 degrees out of phase with our main signal for it to work its magic. Why 180 degrees? To get the noise cancellation effect, we need an offset signal. And we'll look at that in a minute. Some of the advantages of NFB, or negative feedback, include tightening up the sound, lower distortion, higher damping, and better bass. The disadvantages include a more complex circuit, a lower output signal, and the possibility of messing with the linearity of the sound. Okay, let's take a look at the schematic for my Yuri monoblock to see the circuit I experimented with this week. Now the URI is nearing completion as a design and will be released as a kit amp this fall, but I'm always looking at ways to improve it. Now, if you've got good eyesight, you'll see that I'm actually at version 7.0, which means I've actually built seven complete versions of the amp, and with the negative feedback circuit, I would call that uh, an eighth version. This is probably the one that is going to be the kit amp version. I've been living with it since the end of August, and it's delightful. It sounds lovely. It's dynamic. It's exciting. Uh, I got the amp up to 2 watts RMS, which is really nice. It's a lot more power than I need. My speakers are about 95 dB efficient, and uh, that at that point, 90, this amp could easily handle 93 dB and up efficient speakers. And there's actually quite a selection of them out there. Uh, commercially available. So uh, let's just draw in the circuit the way I built it. Let's start over here. So actually we should walk you through it so that you you know where everything is. So here's the signal coming into the power amp, the RCA in. Signal comes onto the grid of the first tube, the CV6 and a whole bunch of other numbers. We're going to look at uh, a Russian version in a second. The, and um, so the signal comes on, it gets, it gets modulated here, picked up on the plate. Signal comes through a coupling capacitor onto the grid of the power tube, the 6P7S. And the signal is taken off, it's amplified, it's taken off the plate again, and it comes through the output transformer over here. Here's your B+, plus, your high voltage coming into one leg of the output transformer, and of course it feeds the plate of the driver tube. A driver tube is just basically a preamp tube for the power tube. It gets the voltage up to an operating point um, that the power tube can work with. So, now that we know where everything is roughly laid out, what did I do? Well, if negative feedback is taking a signal from a later stage and bringing it back. And this is only a two-stage amp. We don't have too many choices, do we? So what I did was I took the signal off the 4-ohm tap. This is your speaker out. This amp has a, um, it has a, a ground, a 4-ohm tap, or an 8-ohm tap, which is really very common these days. So I took the tap on the out, output of the 4-ohm. You can take it on the 8-ohm. It just so happens I have 4-ohm speakers, so that's why I did it that way. So here it comes. Now, in reality, this, this wire is nowhere near that long. So we'll draw a little resistor here. And this is actually a Mullard circuit that I borrowed. Mullard published a, a really terrific um, design book that was extremely detailed. A lot of the designs... Uh, that they're not that interesting in the tubes that they use these days. 
because uh, the design book, I think, was written in the 1950s, has many editions. I have one of the later editions. Uh, but they didn't update the tubes that they were using. But in the designs that Mullard published, um, the um, there's all kinds of really great circuits to give you know, young designers um, uh, like me um, an opportunity to, to look at how you know the real pros did it back in the day. Okay, now I'm working upside down. Maybe I should just turn it around and take a look at it. It's good. Okay, so let's walk through what's going on here. In fact, actually, let's put some signals. So here we go on the input. We're coming in at a, at a off a preamp, and we're going to have a very low input, right? So that's the positive phase and the negative. That's normally how we start the display of the phase of the signal in any amp. Unless we know for certain what the phase is coming in, we start positive, we go negative. Over here, coming off of the plate, the signal inverts. Every time you put a signal through a power tube and you take it off of the plate, it inverts. If you take it off the cathode, in a cathode follower, it stays the same as the preceding stage. So now we've put a lot of gain on this tube. So maybe, let's say, 17 to 1, a gain of 17 perhaps. I'd have to look at the, at the spec to check to see exactly what my gain is. So the signal is inverted. So it starts off in the negative phase, and it's much bigger now, right? Okay, everybody got that? So we come on to this, onto our power tube, and again we're taking the signal off the plate, and again it's going to invert, right? And it's going to get, the signal's going to get bigger. So there's our output, and you may have noticed, because we flipped it back, that we're in phase, right? So we're in phase with the input signal. Whatever the input signal is, this is the signal we've got here. And if our output transformer is wired correctly, and we haven't reversed any wires, this is the phase coming off of the output transformer. Let's just draw a little line here so you can see. So there's your positive phase, and there's your negative phase. And right here, this is your zero volts right here. There you go. So, what, what's going on? So, we've taken a tap, we're coming through. Now, obviously, we're not going to put all of the power uh, of the output stage onto the cathode of our driver tube. So, we put a resistor here. And we drop, and that resistor will give us, a, we can vary the size of the resistor, and that will give us a variable amount of feedback and when I did my little experiment, I tried a number of different values and a number uh, of different levels of feedback, shall we say, to see how I liked it. And this is just a small resistor to ground here. This forms a little divider network. Um, and I'm not 100% sure why Muller designed the circuit this way, but I believe it allows us to come in cleanly with the feedback at this point in the circuit. Normally, the cathode would go straight to ground here. So in the Mullard case, um, in their circuit, they had just a simple 100 ohm resistor in here, a very low value resistor. So the signal comes on. Now, what is the phase of the signal? This is what's important. Signal is going to be this, right? What's the signal coming off of the plate? Ah, you say. OK, so this is 180 degrees out of phase. When you see it drawn like this, and if I had it on the scope, I would have loved to have put it up on the scope so you could actually see it, but it's impossible to do these short videos and do, you know, everything. <laughs> so trust me, if we put it up on the scope, this is what it would look like. So we're 180 degrees out of phase coming on here. Now, my good friend Ron, who, um, who was an electrical engineer back in the day when tubes ruled, and um, and he was helping maintain um, a whole series of TV station relays. He said, when when you back in the day, 
many home builders didn't have access to scopes. They were incredibly expensive. And so what, what builders did, because you were never 100% sure as to whether the phase had been maintained correctly, is that you would just wire it up and determine whether or not um, you were you were you had positive feedback or negative. If you had positive feedback, you'd have noise. <laughs> and if you had negative feedback, uh, you would drop your output slightly. Maybe I I think of roughly ten percent. So it depends on the circuit, but you 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 can physically see the output drop on your on your voltmeter, and then you know that you've got the circuit in. Uh, the correct phase. And you can actually just reverse these two wires here and that that'll change the phase. And you can actually reverse the 0 and the 4 and the 8. You can flip that. Um, and that'll reverse the phase as well. You can flip the 4 with the 0 or the 8 with the 0. Um, so it's quite easy to change the phase and get and get yourself offset like this. So that's all there is to it. Now, you can do other things. You can feed back from here, and you can feed back over to here. Um, and in a, in a more complex amp, let's say a three-stage um, amp, you could feed back all the way, if you had a third tube, let's say, in here, you could feed back to the middle tube, the second stage, or you could feed back to the first stage. And that's all there is to it, folks. Now. In the case of the URI, it's quite interesting. I was looking to increase the damping a little bit, and maybe we'll do a tube lab on damping. Um, it's going to require a fair, fair explanation. Basically, tubes, tube amps have fairly low damping compared to solid state, and I thought I could maybe improve the sound a bit with more damping, and I increased the damping about 10%, but I also dropped the output uh, about 10%. And frankly, uh, even though the sound tightened up a bit, I like the linearity of the simpler design without the feedback. I liked it a lot more, actually. And it only took me um, a day of experimenting with various amounts of feedback. To, by the next morning, I was tearing apart the, the temporary circuit and putting it back to the way it was. Okay, enough blah, 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 talking about tube amp mods, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Let's take a look at what came in this week. Well, if you follow me, you know I've talked about the fact that I almost never get original early boxes of Russian tubes. Well, <laughs> I lied because I just, well, I didn't lie. I, I just, I, I'll have to correct that statement because I just got in some boxes for one of my favorite tubes. This is actually the tube that we were looking at over here. Let me go grab that. That's that's the CV6, or the Russian version of it, which in Cyrillic is 6C8C, but the C in English is an S, so it's we call that the 6S, 8S. And uh, it's one of my favorite driver tubes. It's really a lovely, the, all the tubes in this family are lovely sounding tubes. They're very low noise because they were made for radar originally. And I've gone on and on about this, but let's have a look at the box. They all had um, cardboard around to protect the tube, and they all had what looks like carpet backing. You know that really crappy looking recycled fabric? I don't know if you can see in the bottom. And they all had, let me see, well, not all of them had it, but originally they all came. Let's see if I can get it out. There we go. They all have this wonderful sheet. Now, I've never opened this up. Let's hope it doesn't disintegrate. The Russians put these sheets quite often in. And uh, we've got a number. I don't know, is that the tube number? I don't think so, but maybe. And we get the um, electrical specifications. We get the OTK stamp with the date. Can we read that? I can see 5353. So maybe the fifth day of the third month, 1953, and somebody signed it. Uh, with a fountain pen, I believe. I don't think there were any ballpoints in 1953. 
and we've got more dating here, I think, and another signature certifying the tube, I believe, and of course the pinout. Isn't that lovely? It's, it's just so much fun to see these historic documents. We'll put that away carefully in a minute. So this is a Svetlana. Svetlana made some wonderful tubes. You can see that this is one of their logos. It's a giant C, right? C for S. And it's got the OTK stamp on it. And they're all test very strong, uh, well over new old stock. And that's, that's common with this particular tube. The spec for these tubes, um, even though they all basically can interchange, it was fairly flexible. For example, the top caps, one's the plate, one's the grid, but the top caps, and let me see if I got which one's right, whichever cap goes to the outer edge of the plate, that's the plate. Whatever cap goes to the middle connection, that's the grid connection. But depending on where the tube was made and when it was made, these get reversed periodically in relation to the key. That's how you figure it out. I'm glad I remembered that. So the key's on this side, right here. So if this, if this is the um, plate connection, and it is, then I remember that by the plate is on the key side. If I check out uh, a British-made mullet, it's probably reversed. Anyways, um, for a 1950s tube, they are just beautifully made. Look at that. Some of them have the plates horizontally up here. Now the whole idea of these top cap connections is to get the leads as short as possible so that they won't act as antenna and pick up any interference. Now for high frequencies that the tube's operating at for radar, uh, that's absolutely critical. But for audio, we get to benefit from the precautions they took for what is essentially a military tube and it works brilliantly in audio. I don't think I've had a single one of these from any of the manufacturers get noisy, um, which is really unusual, especially for tubes from the 1950s. 40s and 50s are my main collection of these tubes. Okay, what else came in? Let's put that down carefully. Oh, look at this thing. This is one of those tubes that's so big, I have to back up a little bit. This is the 830B. Now, it's made by Taylor. And have we got a date on the box? We do. Uh, I think we do. I don't sure if we do have a date on the box. Let's have a look over here. Let me get that up close for you. US, U.S. Army Signal Corps. We've got an order here, 2562. I think 62 is the year, probably, 1962. Um, but I'm not sure about that. And I don't think we have another indicator of what the date is. Now, Taylor uh, Tubes, I believe, is based near Chicago. And they specialized in making... Um, large um, broadcast tubes. So they, look at look at how gorgeous that is. I'm still probably in too close. Now often when I take out um, when I take out a tube that's been sitting around in a box for 60 years it's dirty but look at that it's pretty clean. It's got a little bit of you know um, storage dust on the bottom. But have a look at this Taylor made tube. It is just absolutely pristine. It's gorgeous how it's made. Look at the big ceramic um, isolators or spacers at the top and bottom. It's got a top plate which is almost certainly going to be for the high voltage B+. Plus. Yeah. And of course the back is very much the same. And it's got a large uh, bottom getter. So we have what I call waste chrome down here. And let me just grab the data sheet. See if I can do two things at once here. And let's put the tube down somewhere safe. So what the heck? Well, we got a top plate on a big tube. What, 
we know right away when you see that you know this is the RCA data sheet. I can't actually find the Taylor data sheet, but it's the same tube. DC plate voltage is 1000 volts max. Plate dissipation is 60 watts max. Wow. So my hope is someday we're going to have a high powered um, kit amp that's going to take this as a single, in class A, as a single ended triode run it in triode mode. But I'll have to do some experimenting. Let's back that up a little bit more. I have to do some experimenting. That's a long way off. It's going to be a large investment um, in iron and the transformers and the development costs will be expensive as well because none of this a thousand... I don't think we'll have to run it at a thousand um, a thousand volts but we might be running at seven, 750 volts which is convenient because that's the maximum my uh, my large um, power bench power supply can take and that is running two sections in series to get it up to 750 volts but uh, anyways this, this is a long term project and I thought you'd have fun taking a look at the tube and the hopes is to have a, a low powered um, small system uh, monoblock for the majority of people who have small places. I mean, vast majority of people in the world today live in urban and the urban environment, so they're living in apartments. And uh, if you've li ever lived in an apartment, you you know you can't play. It's not proper. You can't play your music loud. It's just not going to happen. It's verboten. <laughs> I remember when I was a young teenager in my first apartment, the things were built like um, like bunkers. They were so solid, all concrete. But I had the I had Neil Young up playing loud one day, and uh, the hammering coming through that wall was pretty loud. She didn't come next door to tell me off, but the, that was enough to tell me to turn it down. Um, so the vast majority of us don't need a big power amp. We couldn't use it. Uh, so my hope is to have. Um, is to get the URI going as a kit amp, to have uh, perhaps a medium powered amp for those that need a little bit more power that have less efficient speakers, and someday to have a really big uh, um, high powered amp like using something like this. We'll have to see if the A30B is going to be a tube that we can work with or not. Oh, look at the date on the data sheet. This tube goes all the way back to 1936, March the 20th. Interesting, eh? And that means it was probably developed by RCA and maybe RCA licensed Taylor to make them. Most of the tubes I've seen so far are Taylor tubes. Only a handful have been RCA and that's it. I haven't seen a single other manufacturer. Okay, well, hopefully that was fun. If you stay to the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping around the world of $20 and free shipping if your order is $150 or more after discount. Stay safe, everybody. This is Jim from Vowels and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.